welcome to this second video in the Planning Your Coaching for Youth Development uh, series of five videos. This video is going to be focusing on understanding the who. So working from our first video we talked about the importance of who, what and how. So this video will be particularly focusing on the who. So my name is Dr. Andre Abraham. Joining me are Dr. Kevin Till and Dr. Julian North. So um, we're going to kick off with you, Julie, just to perhaps give us a, a, an idea of how we can look at this who-based area and how that might help coaches in terms of their, their planning and decision making. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about the uh, bigger picture processes in terms of play development. What are the processes that uh, impact on how players develop? And I think there's two uh, important images that occupy our minds as coaches, as parents. The first is a, a, a kind of natural, innate or genetic talent uh, whose rise to the top is not really impacted on by training or competition, they're just talented people. They, they get there, people think about Lionel Messi being, being talented as if nothing could have stopped him going to the top. So, so that's one image. The other image is the idea of that the more you practice and the, the focus practice and through deliberate practice and if you do enough of it you can become an expert performer. So this is a very kind of a, not a genetic idea of talent at all, this is a very kind of environmental view of talent but it's an extreme opposite of the genetic view. Mm -hmm. So these are two images we often um, think about, um, I think the, the, the former, the genetic one is, uh, it seems to be very, um, it seems to have a hold amongst uh, many parents and coaches at the community level mm. and I think uh, in terms of the environmental the more you practice for you that it's more of a kind of recent fashionable thing maybe through the work of, uh, of uh, um, Ericsson and the 10,000 hours role mm. but I think basically um, both of those images are wrong because it's, it's a really combination of factors mm -hmm genetics, of time and other things as well we now talk about and I'd just like to um, use the example of uh, Javi Hernandez, um, ex-Barcelona player, um, winner of the World Cup, um, European Championship, various honours for Barcelona, born in 1980, World Cup winner 30 years later in 2010. So what kind of, how might these, these processes, these, uh, these processes under the underlying development have impacted on, on, on Javi Hernandez? So we can see there that to win a World Cup there are certain things that we need, certain desirable characteristics that needs to be athletic, it's for the right physical makeup, it needs to have the right um, psychological characteristic, mentally tough and he has to work hard. Of course, to play football, that's of the right technique and uh, tactical understanding. So, how is it that he, that Xavi managed to develop these capabilities, these capacities over time? And it's through the combination of these things we've talked about, through biology, through genetics, through you know, psychological um, factors, and through social circumstances, and even a bit of luck, the combination of those things that those characteristics emerge. So, for example, starting at the beginning of, of Javi's journey, maybe when he's four to five years old, um, biologically he's experiencing a release of growth hormone that promotes uh, physical development. Um, psychologically, a uh, four to five year old are very ego orientated, they don't have particularly uh, strong working memory, so therefore the task you give them have to be fairly, fairly simplistic. Socially, we know for a fact uh, um, with Javi that his parents were very supportive and that he had an older br brother to play with. So that gave him early social experiences, of, uh, positive social experiences of football. And so he was lucky that he, lucky that he had these parents. And he, also he was very close to a very, very um, good local club that had a, a good coaches for, for play development. So this is just the early experiences. Let's see how this moves on. So he's in these environments and all these factors are, are, are interacting and he starts to show, he starts to exhibit these characteristics so he starts to show signs of being healthy, fit, coordinated, that he's prepared to, to work hard and he listens to his coaches, um, that he's, he, he's pretty good at 
compared to his peers, um, controlling the ball and he's able to find a pass when maybe some of his peers can't. So these, these signs are starting to show. But the, the important thing about it is that they are just showing, there's, there's nothing particularly predictive at that, at, that, at, at that moment in time. That's right, yes, I think um, it would be very dangerous. I think, I think we, we would all warn against um, using uh, factors such as performance as an indicator of uh, it's a, a method of selecting it. Because so much can change as, as he evolves over time. Yeah. So maybe he reaches his teenage years and these factors come up again. So biologically there is a growth hormone release associated with sexual change of puberty that has to be managed. Psychologically he's much more uh, sophisticated in terms of his uh, receipt and processing of information, which means the environment's can be more complex in which, he, in which he's um, doing his training. Um, socially he may be in a situation where because of the characteristics he showed earlier on he's, he's selected for particular environments where he gets better coaching, better facilities and so on. And it might be that he, he gets very, very lucky uh, because of the club he's with at that time that it just happens he has a very, very good game when the Barcelona scouts are, are watching. So it's just the luck really just play an important part of this. So basically these same processes work over time, so you have this interaction of the biological, psychological and social, look at other things as well, they all work together like a, like in a big washing machine, you know? and uh, sometimes there will be periods of uh, kind of accelerated development, sometimes there will be troughs, uh, this is just all the natural part of, of development, but over time someone like Xavi has just shown how the interaction of these factors um, leads to, can lead to expert performance and performance at the highest level and someone could potentially be a World Cup, World Cup winner. Um, so really to to manage uh, the de development of a young player in terms of like someone like Xavi and Andres who is young, you've got to, it's important for coaches to understand these development processes, understand that sometimes you have to be patient with people, that it's a long term process. Um, and also you've got to, it's very important I think to understand um, the developmental um, characteristics and ideas of each of these domains, the biological, psychological and social, and that's something that I think that you guys are now going to discuss. Yeah, so I think the, this idea that you've been talking about there is the, that these things interplay, so you, you might look at it and go, well we just have to let that be just have to let that happen and play out but actually one of the things is this is about planning so we're talking about well how can we use this this sort of idea of the interplay between the environment and the and the characteristics of the learner and how we might actually perhaps facilitate that but starting from the basis of well we can't predict what a five-year-old is going to be like when they're 25 or even you know 15 for that matter but what we can do is understand the things which seem to facilitate people becoming good at something, irrespective of what that thing is. You know, everyone has the opportunity to become good at something. So I think this idea that we plan about who this person is based on this biological and social and psychological being is who is this person, how can we help them? Yeah. Um, so I think uh, for me one of the places to start with that, and it's, there's lots of psychological theories, so this is one which I think is particularly useful, is the idea that the person stood in front of you will behave in a certain way for a certain set of reasons and one of the things that Dietschy and Ryan talk about is saying that their motivation will have an impact on that and they talk about three core elements that impact on that motivation which is their sense of autonomy, their sense of competence and their, their sense of relatedness of whether or not they feel like they belong and often that will be, have a, a, a lot to do with who they think they are. So we might have, so I coach rugby on a um, Sunday morning. So who's the, who are these people, who are these young boys who are stood in front of me and why is it that some of them mess about, why is it some of them are um, really quite focused, why is it some of them sort of phase in and phase out. And a lot of it's to do with who they think they are and their sense of motivation to do that. So, so if, you're, if you're a coach, how might you use these ideas to set up a session? Well I think the, it's interesting because I think for me it's changed recently because I, I think you know, we, we try to create a curriculum that we share with the boys so that they've got some sense of knowing what it is that, that they're coming for. Um, 
so you know so they're more able to relate to it it also means that we've got a clearer view of what it is we're trying to get them better at so in the first video bob was talking about the importance of knowing what well you need to know what people need to be better at because if you don't then how will you ever know if they're going to get a sense of competence um but also the sense of autonomy is feeling that they've got a say in things that you know that they've got the capacity to have a say in the practice design maybe or in what they try to do where they play on the pitch, you know, do they play, you must play there, in fact, no, you can play in several different positions. Um, so, and, and, you know, perhaps in swimming, that they get a say in terms of, you know, swimming has perhaps has a view of people just plowing up and down, well, does it have to be like that? We, so, there's lots of ways in which we can use this in order to socially facilitate children's development. So, we talk, you were talking about social environment, you know, what can parents do, it's not just the coaches, mm -hmm. can parents help with this? Can the club help with this in terms of helping the coach to help the players? So you might look at the broader social structures that the, the players have been involved in. How could the coach work with the parents to set up the right environments for their for their children as well? Exactly. Yeah. You know, so it's this idea of open having an open communication with parents to say you're important in this child's development. So I think this one theory is, is really useful from understanding sort of psychologically but also understanding how the social environment might impact on how a child and uh, a talent performer may feel when they turn up to a, you know, to a training or how they even feel about engaging in training for a long period of time. So mm -hmm. it's a really nice theory to start with. Um, the, the, the second thing which I would introduce on this is the work from um, you met from R and Dave Collins about what's known as psychological characteristics that determine excellence. And they've been doing a lot of work trying to, uh, trying to look at what are these skills. So mental skills training has been around a long, long time. It's not new to, to coaches. But what they've tried to do is say, well, what are these skills that people need? Because some of them, they're not innate, but some of them will have different balances of them uh, in whatever. But but ultimately, they are things that can be learned. Um, so we've got several here, so commitment to performance domain, vision of what it takes to develop, goal setting, focus, distraction control, belief can excel, quality practice, coping with pressure, realistic performance evaluations, social and communication skills, which we'll talk about in a bit more depth in a second, um, and imagery. So these things seem to be common across the people who seem to make the most of their talent. Um, so it's really, really important. So, um, so coaches can plan for these sorts of things. Um, it's, it's these are just words on a slide. So, what coaches would need to do is think: Well, what does that look like for, let's say, a twelve-year-old in the middle of a season? So, where would we start? We might. So, if we took goal setting for an example, we might use goal setting as being an important skill we get into in pre-season it fits with that's when you would do it. Um, however something like coping with pressure might be that that we know that players that, you know, start to get a little bit concerned about what it's like when they go and play another team or they perhaps go to a swimming goal or they even take an exam. So we might start to facilitate the development of coping skills as we know bef that that task or that competition is, uh, is coming up because it's a good time to do it. It's far yeah. to do that, to do that beforehand before they go into it. And that's a lot. A lot of what this is about is saying we should we should plan for these things, and we should plan them on the basis of when they are aligned with other things that we're doing within the program. Because as any coach knows, there's limited time. You go, well, when do I do this? Well, if you've looked at your plan, you go, well, we know we've got competitions coming up here. It's quite important. So players are probably going to start feeling a bit um, pressured with this. Well, that's a good time to think, well, perhaps six or seven weeks prior to that, we start to think about how we're helping them cope with those skills. One of the reflections that, that I would have on this is, obviously, if you're working with younger players, then you wouldn't be looking to rigidly stick to that list. You know, if you're talking about a six or seven-year-old, you think, oh, my God, uh, they yeah. haven't got realistic performance evaluations. You yeah. probably wouldn't need to worry about that. But they, they were kind of an aspirational list that grows as the, as the athlete grows. Yes, yeah. I mean, uh, so I, I work with uh, under 10s. I'll probably be saying the important ones for me would probably be, would probably are not getting into realistic performance evaluations and also some, um, some goal setting and almost certainly some focus on distraction control because you know, 
and those get distracted very easily. So those are important for me at the moment, but I will then start to look at, well, what else do I need to start to get into as they get older and as we start to move into perhaps a situation where competition means a bit more and a bit more and a bit more to you. Yes. So, so you, you so it's not like you have to do everything at once any more than you have to teach the whole sport all at once. Mm -hmm. you know, there's, yeah. there's, there's time to develop these We things. don't want to make coaches scared by having to no. make a list of things no. and it isn't over so, now. So I think, so when we've done this, we've sat down as a group of coaches and gone, which do we think are important for these, for these boys at this moment? Yeah. Um, so within that we talk about social skills. Um, but actually, social skills, I hear all coaches talk about it a lot, but then you sort of press a little bit and go, well, can you define what you mean by that? And the definition often isn't there. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's not necessarily the fault of the coach per, per se. It's actually because these things are said, but not necessarily a very, very well impacted in the literature. So we've had a go at actually thinking about, well, what do we mean by these things? So we've come up with four broader areas of ability to adapt to contextual situations, um, ability to regulate emotions, effective language skills and understanding social values, which if you then go across, it's this idea of skills of social reasoning. So do you understand where you sit within, uh, within a group? So as a child, you know, is it right that you would um, constantly um, mess about and disrupt your, your peers? Because if they want to learn, that's that's you know, socially that's not very nice. So we can work with children on the basis of understanding their role and their responsibilities within a social setting and their capacity to think things through. Um, emotional skills, so uh, for example, empathy pers perspective taking. So it's it's very common that parents will say to to children or teachers will say to children, well, how would you feel if someone had done that to you? It's actually quite an important question. It's this idea of developing some level of empathy in terms of understanding how your actions impact on others and how others impact on you. Um, equally, self-control. You know, we have people even now, you know, with phones, etc. You know, there's a lot of distractions for, for people. So this a capacity to control your behaviour and remain you know, focus is important. Mm -hmm. Early on for children. Participation skills, being part of a group, capacity to actually work with a group, develop trust. So we, you know, we know that within sort of trust sounds, it's one of these questions which or points which well, what is that? Well, quite often what you'll see is in uh, in team sports is people will make a decision not to engage other people in that, and we'll call that a clique. But actually, it's not a clique. It's actually quite often just because they don't trust the person they're going to pass pass that ball to, for example. Mm -hmm. So, why don't you trust them? What is it they're expecting will happen if they do that? And so it's perhaps helping uh, participants understand each other's strengths and weaknesses so you can develop that trust, mm -hmm. as an example. Interaction skills, communication skills, um, again, these are very important, so just simple common courtesy. We get that a lot in some sports. Um, the, the capacity to offer a constructive opinion, you know, your willingness to actually speak to your other uh, participants or to your coach, to actually offer an opinion. You know, quite often people are quite shy about doing that. Can I, am I allowed to do that? Well, yeah, it's very important. Um, and understanding social values, um, having respect, having compassion, playing to rules. These are all important social skills. And all of these things can be defined within the setting that you're in, and then they can be practiced. So, and we can plan for those things. And again, there's a lot there. So, as a group of coaches, you make a decision on what is it that we think we need to work on at this moment in time, and then you progressively improve that as as the, as the planning goes on. So that's my bit done. So, Kev, I think we're going to move to you to then. So we've done bio. Sorry, we've done the psychosocial areas. So Kev, you're going to talk to us from the bio work. Yeah, so we're going to go on some of the biological and the, the physical uh, attributes that we can think about uh, planning and, and coaching. So this uh, this model is called the New Physical Development Model um, by uh, Roger Lloyd and John Oliver, which provides a nice overview of some of the physical qualities that we can can think about in uh, in terms of planning and when they can be planned depending on the, the age and the stage of the participant. So for example, if we, um, if we look at the, the sort of the area there in the middle in the, in the blue, in the light blue and then the darker blue, it, it provides a, a range of physical qualities. 
So for example, uh, fund FMS is fundamental movement skills and um, looking at how the children develop, fundamental movement skills are, are important to, de to develop in, in childhood, sort of up to the, the age of eight, so that should be a really a focus um, during that time. With then SSS is sports specific skills, so you know, they then progress as the child gets older and, and should be a real focus from, from 12 years of age. Then this idea of these other physical skills of um, mobility, agility, uh, speed, power, uh, strength and then also endurance at the bottom are, are physical qualities that you can see and based on the, the, uh, the diagram there the, the, these are actually areas that you can, can develop throughout childhood and ad adolescence and should also always be sort of considered within, within your planning around developing these. Interestingly that en endurance is based on the size of the lettering is, is actually um, less uh, of an important uh, aspect uh, compared with some of the other areas and that's because from a, a physical performance that actually you know, children whenever they're undertaking activity they're always working on their endurance capacities and that's something that's just done through playing sport whereas sometimes all those other areas of agility, speed, power, strength are, are often ne ne neglected a little bit within within the planning and, and coaching within within children. <clears throat> so if we just flick on to the next slide, I and mean, I like to, to look at this in terms of a, a, a pyramid, of a, a performance pyramid, and actually at the, the base of that pyramid for, for all, all children is, is around getting these fundamental movement skills right and starting to develop those, okay? So fundamental movement skills can incorporate quite a large number of, of aspects, but uh, from a physical perspective, we, we want to look at that in relation to, to stability. So can children actually you know, balance, balance them correctly? Okay, can they do some simple um, body weight movement patterns, such as a squat or a lunge? How can they perform them right and are they doing the right, the right movement mechanics? And then also in, incorporating things such as actually being able to land correctly from a, from a jump or um, you know, from a hop and things like that. So being able to control the body. You can also then look at these ideas of, of locomotor skills. So locomotive is around, is around movement. Uh, and actually having the correct technique to, to move correctly. So r running technique and jumping technique are things that could be incorporated within that. And then the last one at the bottom is, is around mobility. So actually what's the, the range of, of motion around specific joints and actually being more mobile and flexible will improve movement skills to, to be able to perform better technical skills uh, as well. So they're the basis of the pyramid. And then following that from a physical pers perspective is this idea of strength. Now, <clears throat> when we mention the word strength, that can actually be sometimes scary for coaches and we often think of around lifting weights and, and, and getting big, but strength's not, strength development is not about that. Strength is actually really strongly related to those fundamental movement skills and actually being able to be stable with the body and control that. So actually just performing body weight exercises, such as a body weight squat, is a strength based exercise where we're using our using children and adolescents uh, on body weights as a uh, overload in relation to that. Obviously as children then progress on skills they can then look to start to add some resistance, whether that is just things such as um, you know a medicine ball and then progressing to, to, to weight lifting and, and resistance training as they get older. But why strength is sort of in the middle there is because that's an important aspect and it's also related to all other physical characteristics. So normally if an individual is stronger they're more likely to be, to be faster, have greater speed, they're likely to be more powerful, they're likely to be able to change direction, have better agility and also be, be better in terms of their endurance performance. So these are some of the things that are important actually, strength is, is often neglected within, within the, uh, the planning and, and delivery of that. And then hopefully, the, if, if, if we implement some of these physical skills, um, that will hopefully lead to, to greater uh, participation and performance. So we just flick on. on it. <coughs> so actually, developing skills makes, people, makes children healthier. It, it means they're able to, to take part, part in more uh, sport, have uh, less injuries. So there's a greater sports participation that occurs there, but it also relates to better performance because as has been shown in quite a lot of research that actually the athletes that have, do have great physical qualities normally perform the better and, and are selected as well so it's a real important consideration in relation to that. So just to, just to conclude 
um, is uh, an idea of how some of these things can be incorporated within a session. <clears throat> okay, so a, an ideal area to do that within a within a coaching session is is within the warm up, and this idea of, of what we call uh, the acronym ramp warm up is around uh, how that can be can be done. So there's really three areas. So the first area is in in relation to raise. So warm up. Um, is first of all we need to look at increasing the, the body temperature and, and getting the participant participant ready to, to perform. So that could be done through a raise. Traditionally that may be done by just sending participants on a lap of the field. But <clears throat> obviously if we plan appropriately then there's actual activities that we can do within that to, to work on some of those uh, physical qualities. And the fundamental movement skills is probably an ideal time to do that. So that could include actually working on some running technique work it could even include some object control, so some general skill development within that. So that's, you know, plan the, the raise activity that leads into the rest of the session. The second part of the warm-up is then this idea around activating the, the key muscles and mobilising the joints. So traditionally within coaching, that is a, the static stretch element of the, the session. But again, we want to move away from that and have dynamic actions that are related to the uh, performance and the sports that we're going to do. So this can be a good opportunity to work on some stability, some strength and some mobility through dynamic based activities that can be done using different circuits, different movement drills, even getting children to be different animals and different shapes that, that may challenge, challenge different positions. Then the last part of that is this idea around potentiating the performance. So potentiate is around increasing the intensity. Um, so participants are ready to go into the activities that they're going to do. So that can include elements from a physical perspective of speed, power, agility, where we're looking to incorporate little drills, relays, little reactions, some jumping activities, maybe even wrestling for contact sports that really increases them. So actually for a 15 to 20 minute warm up, if that's a, a planned a, accordingly, we can actually hit quite a lot of those um, physical qualities that are, that are important for, for health and, and performance. So Kev, that, that's clearly within a warm-up, that's something we can plan for within a session. Uh, but going back to your, your this, this slide you talked about with, with Lloyd and all of it, what's, what are sort of things that coach you can do in a, if, they're, if they're starting to look like a, a season long or maybe even two season long sort of situation? What, how can coaches think about this in terms of a progression, do you think? Yeah, so uh, I think, I think uh, first of all, it's it's um, it's identifying that we, we can incorporate these, these um, areas into to the warm up and then it's looking at starting to think longer term how, how we can progress progress some of those things so within children it may start to be more around you know uh, fun fun based activities and and then but actually then looking to um, you know also have a, a areas where it's it is a learning environment where they're learning certain movements as well and, and obviously that's sometimes a challenge for coaches in, in learning what those exercises are um, but also again that probably depends upon um, the demands of the sport and, and, and mm. things like that to think around uh, what what factors are, are more important from a physical perspective. So you've done this a lot in rugby, what sort, yeah. of, sort, sort of things that you've been doing in that? Yeah so so within, within rugby we, we really try and within uh, younger ages is around getting those fundamental movement skills of, of, of basic um, basic exercises that we then look to progress in the gym such as a squat, a lunge, a, mm -hmm. a push up, a, a, a pull up, those sorts of things that so that younger children can actually do the movements and have, have got the required technique and then as they progress through and um, can then go more into a gym based environment to start working on strength and power which are related to you know mm -hmm. speed and agility, they can then progress progress that and start to load that. So you, you have these sort of relatively I'm going to say basic movements, but they, they, these are all movements which underpin uh, children and, and talented young performers' capacity to actually complete the movements that are, that are in, embedded within the sport and innate within the sport. Exactly, yeah. So, so they're movements that are then related to, to some technical skill elements and will have an impact upon skill. So, you know, if we think of a tackle within rugby, it's important that, um, that uh, lower body strength is a, an important element of that. Mm -hmm. So actually first being able to, to understand an exercise from a, a movement perspective, mm -hmm. so then that can be then start to be loaded within within a gym environment is is important. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so just in, in summary then, um, what, what we've managed to go through there then is, is talking about, uh, you've talked about that this is a dynamic interaction of biopsychosocial and uh, genetic factors that all come to play within you know, a child and a young person's development, which is, again, we've talked in the previous video, that this is you know, potentially a um, 14 or 15 year long process. So it's, mm -hmm. it takes a long time for these things, so let's, let's keep forgetting that Let's not forget that it's, you can't predict what a five-year-old's going to become. Well, if you think, um, like many, so I mean, football, for example, common sport in the UK, that many kids join, start playing football around five or six, and they won't be joining the first team until they're maybe in their early to mid-20s, so it's a 20-year period. Yes. So we have to be patient and maybe even start to think about how we plan for the long term. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a... So this idea of patience and dynamic interaction is, is important, but then from a, a, a psychosocial perspective, let's make, make sure we set up the correct social setting, um, but also acknowledge that there are some important uh, psychological characteristics um, which will impact on um, children's ability to make the most of the environment that they're being placed in, but also there's some important social skills which are important wherever we are in life, but you know, ultimately if we can learn them through sport, let's learn them through sport. Um, and then finally, based on the work that you've been talking about there, Kev, is you know, there's some, a lot of physical growth and development which occurs, which we can work with in order to facilitate these fundamental movement skills to the strength for areas in terms of power and agility, etc. And then, that then underpins any aspect of sport performance. Um, and it's actually, even if people go into talent programs on onto elite performance, brilliant, but if they don't, these are the sorts of things which facilitate people's long-term health and development anyway. Exactly, yeah, so the, these physical attributes are you know, important for talent, but they're also important for general health and just being able to be active and injury-free, so, right. um, you know, the, yeah, they're important for, for all children regardless of if, they, um, if they want to be a talent performer or, or not. Right. Well, Jay, Kev, thanks very much for your input to, to today's session, and uh, hopefully that's been a, a useful video for, for coaches as well. So thanks very much. Thank you, guys.